Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nadia Peek. I'm a PhD student at MIT, um, and I work on digital fabrication. So just so we're clear, I mean CNC mills, 3D printers, that kind of stuff. Um, this is a picture I took last week. I was in Shenzhen um, buying parts. So Shenzhen, I guess, is partially where Cano is made. Uh, it's, a, it's a center of mass production and uh, uh, it's a center of mass production and using economies of scale to be able to bring out a lot of products. Um, and, and I went there because I want to make machines that enable personal fabrication. So not using economies of scale, not doing mass production, but um, creating machines that allow people to build their own products and uh, their own automation systems. Um, So here, I'm going to start with this story. Advanced manufacturing is a pretty hot research topic. I guess maybe you guys have seen a lot about 3D printing, maybe a lot about robot arms, maybe a lot about automation. Um, and so this is a typical Saturday night at MIT. Uh, this is a, a bunch of students in the back of N52, which is one of the, uh, which is one of the um, shop labs. And uh, on, the, on the right, you see a styrofoam, a styrofoam surface that's being cut by this seven-axis KUKA robot arm with a hot end on it. So it's a complex surface, which is, a, which is being described by a parametric model, which then is turned into a tool path in Grasshopper, in Rhino, um, to be able to describe the motions, the inverse kinematics of the robot arm are all figured out. Um, so all in all, a lot of high-tech stuff is happening uh, in this photo. But on the left, you see a person holding a surge protector. And that's not because he's worried that the robot is going to take over and blow everything up. But he's actually flipping off and on the hot end that's on uh, the hot end that's on the on the on the end of the robot arm because he has to control its temperature. Um, so the easiest way for them to be able to interface with the control system of this robot was for them to insert a human being. Now, human beings are extremely expensive for controlling something as simple as one temperature. Um, and it just seems like a very silly way for you to be able to build something to say, oh, you know. The way that we want to interface with advanced manu manufacturing is just to like hack it. And so this is something that you see a lot. A lot of machines that you use for automation are band-aids, or sometimes they're really expensive band-aids, where you put a whole engineering team on a line to figure out how to um, to figure out how to make something more precise or more accurate. And often it's just this. You know, you, you need to get it done, so you add a surge protector and you use your thumb. Um, so if if this is a hard thing to interface with, let's go through how, does, how do you make something with digital fabrication currently. So maybe you start with a part design. You design something in Pro-E, you design something in Katia, you design something in SolidWorks, whatever. And then say we're, we're milling something out. So you, you create a tool path using, uh, you create a tool path using HSM Works or Mastercam. Um, and then you use a post-processor for a specific kind of machine that you're going to control. And you export G-code. G-code was invented before C. Uh, it only describes certain functions that your computer, that, that, that your machine can interpret. So go to this position, go to that position. Um, you can't incorporate any kind of functions. It's a very, it's a very, uh, it's a very limited interface. And then you take this very high-tech interface um, of a USB key, you take it from the computer that you designed your part on, and you take it to the other computer, the computer that actually runs the machine. Those are two separate computers. Um, and the computer that runs the machine hasn't really changed a lot since the 80s. The, the part, the, the port that you stick your USB stick into on this machine actually says load tape. Um, and then you use this awesome interface. And then you reach into your other pocket, you get an end mill, and then you watch the machine execute the thing that you pre-compiled it to do. There's no part in the system where you can say, I want to change how this machine is running. And so I kind of break down machine design into this pyramid. Uh, and the reason that it's a pyramid shape is because each, each, each of the prototyping steps that you need to take to build any of these things uh, has a certain cycle time. So if you write software, writing software is actually pretty easy comparatively. You write it, you launch it, you see if it works. If it doesn't work, you write it again. Um, you don't lose. The only, the only way you lose money is by spending more time on it. Um, but if you want to prototype a control system, you might have to prototype electronics. You have to go into production. You have to create a bill of materials. Sensors and actuators have the same problem. You have motors that you have to make. Maybe you need a certain kind of motion. You have to generate that. And prototyping a new kind of motor takes longer. And if you want to do an entire mechanical system, then you know, you're, you're talking about things that you can't necessarily get done in an afternoon the way maybe you could write an app. And all of these things are subservient to the tool head that you're moving around on your digital fabrication machine. So maybe if you're 3D printing something, 3D printing, uh, 
if you want to do it by heating up plastic and squirting it out, really, you're limited by how fast your machine can move and how fast you can heat things up. So why are all these machines with these really slow belt systems and, 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 and small heaters instead of large heaters and very fast machines? It's unclear, probably because people aren't prototyping it very much. Um, so at the Center for Bits and Atoms, we think digital fabrication is cool despite all of the annoyances that you have to go through to prototype it. Uh, and so we created these labs called Fab Labs, Fabrication Laboratories, um, and facilitated them opening in lots of different places. And uh, uh, to be able to show people how to make stuff, we had to redo all of the software to control these machines, because we didn't want them to go through all the stuff that we went through. And so they. Uh, they use a CAD CAM interface that we designed to have one unified front for all, all of the different kinds of fabrication machines. And then we thought, if we're going to be rethinking how people have access to fabrication equipment anyway, then why not rethink what the lab looks like in the first place? So this is a multi-purpose CNC fabrication machine that I built with my friend Alan Moyer. It's currently set up to be a milling machine, so it's milling PCBs. So I'm making circuit boards in the grass, so there. <laughs> um, but it's also a 3D printer. Whoops. Can you play the first video, God, Hand of God? And so here it's set up. This kind of feels appropriate music for Slush. In academic conferences is sometimes kind of awkward. And so here it's set up to be, uh, that's the kinematic mount that you put different heads onto. Uh, it has a parallel kinematic stage and a z-axis with a lead screw. Can I start the slides again? Hand of God. <laughs> uh, or we can see all that. So anyway, the machine has a the machine has a control system that uh, is extensible because you put different heads on it, so you need different electronics to be able to control different heads that go on a machine. Normally, you would have to prototype a whole new control system for every different kind of machine that you want to have, or you have to know ahead of time all of the different controls that you're going to need for that specific machine. So instead of doing that, um, I have networked controls. Say you want to add a temperature controller, just add another node on the network. Um, and so I don't mean to bore you guys terribly with code, but instead of writing a control system that interprets G-code, for example, in Python, you can just say, I have a three-axis machine, it has a temperature controller, and this is how it moves around. And so because making control systems is easy, it's easy to make lots of different kinds of machines. So these are all different machines that I made to do different things. Uh, one of them is an aerogel printer, so uh, it's like 3D printing, but with a very different kind of material. A liquid handler for doing biological experiments, because I was tired of my biology friends being stuck in lab. Um, this is a, a scoring head, different kinds of milling machines. And so I started thinking, say we have object-oriented software. We have, we have networked controls for the electronics. And so why don't we also have object-oriented hardware to be able to create different prototypes of machines? Um, so now, can you play the second video person? So this machine uh, is milled up out of these individual linear stages, and uh, so we're gonna we're gonna use it to do four-axis cutting of styrofoam. So here I have two stages already pre-assembled in this configuration. We're setting it up in the we're setting it up in the lobby. This is the control system that I'm hooking up. Um, we wrote the toolpath generation software for it the same day. In fact, this entire machine took less than 17 hours to build from scratch. Um, and uh, and I'm using it to cut hot air. Uh, uh, sorry, to cut um, to to do hot wire cutting of airfoils. Um, so for those of you familiar with airfoil geometries, this was designed by Mark Drella, uh, he's a professor at MIT. Kind of a big deal in aerospace. Um, so this machine is entirely water jet cut and folded. And these are all the different configurations that we're kind of thinking about for, yeah, serious researcher. Um, 
And so um, one of my friends from one of my friends from lab um, ended up at NASA, and he came back to MIT and wanted to do an experiment in the wind tunnel, but he didn't have the right airfoil. And so um, we positioned the we positioned the machine in such a way to cut the airfoils that he needed. Um, and then later that afternoon, we're actually in the wind tunnel testing that airfoil geometry. So if that is not rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping machines, then I don't know what is. And so you can all of the machines that I design um, and all of the control systems, everything is open source, and you can design all. You can download all of the source files um, from this website, machines that make at the Center for Bits and Atoms. Mit. Edu, um, and I'll just end on uh, the last. The last thing that I've been building is like the, the cheapest possible unit of motion. So this is a parametric design file for different thicknesses of cardboard. So you can make a linear stage. Uh, with uh, its control system for less than $30, and then start prototyping motion with that, which I invite you all to do. Thank you.